If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. That ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Once again, welcome to Access. We're so excited that you guys are here this week as we continue our series, Summer of God. And uh, it's, been a, it's a nine-week series, and so this is one of our longer series. In the first three weeks, we spent talking about God the Father, who He is, what that means to us. The next three weeks, we talked about God the Son, Jesus Christ, who He is, what that really means to us. And these next three weeks, as we close out this series, we're talking about the third person of the Trinity, and that is God the Holy Spirit. And I just want to say this up front, that it is absolutely essential in your Christian walk that the Holy Spirit is a part of that Christian walk. It is absolutely essential that he is a part of your life and that you allow him to be a part of your life. And the hard part is that really, especially in a church like this where we have kind of so many people from so many different backgrounds, we all grew up in different kinds of churches, right? And so some of you grew up in a church that uh, maybe the word Pentecostal was used to describe your church. And so you were kind of over here and everything seemed to focus on the Holy Spirit, right? And so you went to church and that's why you were there. And so, you know, all that kind of stuff happened, right? And then some of you grew up in a church where maybe you, you kind of pretended the Holy Spirit didn't exist at all. Like he's kind of the redheaded stepchild over here. Here. Like he's, he's there, but we're really not going to talk about him because he's kind of weird and we really don't understand him. And since we don't understand him, we're going to kind of leave him over there and leave him out of everything. And so we'll really focus on Jesus a whole lot, right? And so you can kind of grow up on either end. And some of you may have grown up in a church that was just kind of balanced. And one of the things we try to do here at Access is kind of hopefully be a little more balanced about it all. And that we understand the Holy Spirit is a real and viable part of the Christian life. That he is fully God, 100% God, just as much God as God the Father is, just as much God as God the Son is, and we're of our devotion and our attention and worthy of our studying and learning more about him, allowing him to be a part of our lives here and today. He's essential for your Christian walk here today. And the reason why that is, is because he's the one that's here with you. Like Jesus isn't here anymore, right? And so God the Father created the earth, but he's, he's in heaven right now. And Jesus came to earth and he spent some time here with us, but he left and he's not here. And the person of God that is here now today on the earth, interacting with you and interacting with me is the Holy Spirit. And so it's absolutely essential that we understand him it's absolutely essential that we get to know him and we allow him to be a huge part of our lives so that we can really truly become the Christian that God created us to be. And so today we're going to kind of dive in and start these next three weeks and we're going to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit and really kind of figure out who he is. And so this week what I want to do is almost kind of do a little bit of an overview of who the Holy Spirit is. I'm going to focus in on one area, but I'm going to give you kind of four, four thoughts about the Holy Spirit and what it is that he's here to do because really the Holy Spirit has, he has a lot of jobs. If you look in the New Testament especially, there are a lot of things that the Holy Spirit is called to do, that his jobs are to be in our life. And like one of those things is he's, he's to be our great comforter, right? And so when you're going through times of duress, when you are in crisis, when you are hurting, maybe you've lost a loved one or some sort of tragedy has happened in your life or in the life of one of your loved ones and you're feeling that, he's to be your comforter. He's to be there with you, holding your hand, guiding you through. And the Bible says that he brings this peace that surpasses understanding. In other words, humanly speaking, nobody really should understand why it is that you have the peace that you have. Have, right? And so you're in the midst of turmoil and you're in the midst of chaos and everything around you seems to be falling apart, yet there's this peace about you that others look at you and say, I just don't get it. Why are you, why do you have peace in your life? Why are you calm right now? You, you should be freaking out and falling apart right now like the world is around you, yet the Holy Spirit comes and he comforts you and that, that's one of his jobs. Another one of his jobs is, is he actually has a huge role in our salvation. And so the Bible says that no man can come to the Father but through the Son. But the way we're drawn to the Son is by the Holy Spirit. He's the one that draws us in. You see, you're born basically dead, according to Paul. That spiritually speaking, you're dead when you're born. And so all you have when you're born is a sinful, evil nature. And that sinful, evil nature has no desire to know and understand who God is. That sinful, evil nature of yours has no desire to have a relationship with your Creator through Jesus Christ. And so what happens is the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life. And you don't know it, and you don't understand it, but He gives begins to draw you to Jesus Christ so that you can find what we would call salvation. So that's a, that's a big role of the Holy Spirit. And today what we're going to look at is, is the idea that really it's the Holy Spirit's job to give you power. And that, and this, that one kind of seems to be the one that's out there a little bit, right? Like this, this power idea of the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of, I can understand comfort, 
And I can understand that he kind of points me to Jesus and helps me to begin a relationship with Jesus. But this idea of us having supernatural power in our lives, that's really the one that's tough to get to grips with. That's the one that we seem to be afraid of the most. And what I want to do is kind of camp out on that idea and show you four ways uh, that the Holy Spirit wants to give you power, four, four areas of your life that he wants to give you power in so that you can function and you can become the person that God created you to be. And so if you have your, your worship guides, when you take them out, you should have some notes in there and the scripture verses are there and there's a few fill in the blanks there. And so we're going to dive right in and we're going to talk about really what it, the power of the Holy Spirit looks, in your, looks like in your life. What is the power of the Holy Spirit here to do in you and through you? And so uh, we're going to jump right in. And the first, first scripture we're going to look at is John chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 16 and 17. And they're there on your notes. They'll also be up on the screen as well. And so let's read this. And so this is, this is actually Jesus speaking. He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. He calls him the counselor quite often. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And right off the bat, we kind of learn three things real quick about who the Holy Spirit is. And the first thing is that he's a person. That the Holy Spirit is actually a person. He's not an it. Uh, you know, for a long time, the church called him the Holy Ghost, which was probably, probably did more damage than it did help. You know, we were trying to kind of describe what a spirit might be, but in, instead of just talking about him as a spirit, we kind of made him like the returning of some dead person or thing. And so ghost, he's not a ghost. Uh, he's not an it. And it's not just some weird entity out there. Uh, the Holy Spirit is an actual person. He's as much a person as God the Father and God the Son. And so he's a very real person that wants to be involved in your life. That's the first thing we learn from the scripture, that, that the Holy Spirit's a person. The second thing we learn really is this, is that those who are not believers cannot and will not understand who the Holy Spirit is. They just won't have an understanding. You see, things of the spiritual are discerned by the spiritual. And so if you do not have the spiritual or the Spirit of God within you, then you can't discern that which is spiritual. And so there are many people out there that can be in the same room as you and you feel like, hey, I feel the presence of God here and they don't feel him at all. And the reason is because you're a believer and they're not. That even happens amongst believers sometimes. There are believers in the room that say, man, God was powerful in that service today. And you have other believers that are like, I didn't feel him a bit. And it just has to do with how open they are in that moment to the spiritual. The spiritual things are discerned by the spiritual. And so the Holy Spirit can only be understood by those who are believers. Now he's interacting with non-believers because he's the one that draws them. They just don't understand it. And it's not until you enter in to a relationship with Jesus Christ that you can actually begin to understand the Holy Spirit's power, work, and role in your life. And so that's the second thing we learn there. And the third thing there is, is probably most important, and that is this, is that the Holy Spirit is in you. I find that very interesting. It's not just with you, he's in you. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this before. I've done this. I've thought to myself, how cool would it be if Jesus was here today? Like, how cool would it be if I got to walk with Jesus? Like, if Jesus was here, things would be a lot easier, right? And so I think I would sin a lot less if Jesus was around me, right? I, I'd, I'd, you know, say the right things more often. If Jesus was standing beside me, I'd make the right choices more often. Um, I probably would read my Bible more, right? If Jesus was standing right there with me, I'd pray more, you know, right? Like, just be holy in front of Jesus, right? And that, I don't know about you, I feel like that's what I would be if Jesus was around. And so there's been times in my life where I've said, man, this would be a lot easier if Jesus was here and now. I don't know if you've ever thought in those terms or even had that idea that how, how good would it be if Jesus was here with us now, things would be so much easier. I just, I'd know what to do because I could just ask him and he's God. And so he would know. And so he could tell us what to do. And I could just live my life perfectly. And then in the end, I'd go to heaven and be with the father and everything would be great. If Jesus was just here now with us. And that's the kind of thought I've had, especially when I was younger, how much easier and better would that be? But according to Jesus, it actually wouldn't be better. Our next scripture verse there, still in the book of John chapter 16, seven, this is what he says, but actually it is best for you that I go away. In other words, it's better for you that I'm not here, right? And this is why. Because if I don't, the counselor, that's the Holy Spirit who he was talking about before, won't come. If I go away, he will come because I will send him to you. And the beauty of it is this. And here's where it really counts for you and me here today. As, that, that as much as Jesus was God, he was also fully man. And so he was, he was bound to this earthly body which means he can only be in one place at one time. Jesus can't just be with everybody, and he can only be with you or with somebody else. He can't be everywhere at one time, but the Holy Spirit, being spirit, can be everywhere at the same time if he needs to be. And the beauty is he's not just there with you, he's actually in you, which means everywhere you go, you take him with you. 
Like I said, Paul wrote this. He said that within you is this sinful nature. But upon finding life, upon rebirth in Christ, now the Holy Spirit begins to dwell in you. And when he dwells in you, now you have his spirit in you as well. And so everywhere you go, it's like having Jesus with you. It's actually better that Jesus isn't here because he can be in you and he can be in me at the exact same time. And so that's what we learned real quick. And the reason why he is there and within us is so that he can give us power. And that power is to do a few different things. And so if you have your notes, the first fill in the blank is this. We're going to jump right into it and just spend the next few minutes here today talking about why it is the Holy Spirit gives us power, what it is that he gives us power to do. And so the first thing is this, is that he gives us power to walk in God's will. Like to actually live in his will. We talked about the idea of kingdom here at Access several times. And we talk about God's kingdom. And, and if you've ever grown up in church, you've heard that term before, God's kingdom. And we really kind of have a hard time understanding what God's kingdom is because we don't live within a kingdom, right? Like America, we don't call it the kingdom of America or the kingdom of Florida. We don't live in the kingdom of Lakeland. Like we don't, we don't live there, so we don't really understand what the kingdom is. But simple, simple uh, kind of a description or... or uh, a definition of kingdom is this, anywhere the king's will is done. And we talked about this before. Well, God wants you to live within his will, which means that he wants you to live within his kingdom. And so in order to do that, you must live within his will. And so God wants to give you the power to live within his will. And the reason why you and I need the power to live within God's will is because what Paul said, we're all born with that sinful nature. And so we all want to live within our own kingdom. We want to live within our own will. And it actually takes the power of the Holy Spirit to help come in and supersede the power of our own will as we go. And it looks different for everybody, but so many times, I think this is, we're starting here because this is the most frustrating question that I seem to get over and over and over again. How do I know I'm doing the right thing? Like, how do I know I'm living for God? How do I know I'm making the right decision? And as a pastor, people come to me on advice to say, how do I know I'm doing the right thing more than they come to me about anything else? Like, how do I know I'm actually in God's will? Like, do I, do I take that job or do I take that job? Should I buy this house or should I not buy this house, right? Should I accept the promotion? Should I not accept the promotion? Should I marry this person? Should I not marry this person? And what we all want, really, is we all want to live within God's will, but we're all frustrated because we don't know necessarily how to do that. And the Bible says it's the Holy Spirit's job to help you to do that. And so this is what the Bible says. It says, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the thing, all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. And in, other, in other words, if you want to live within God's will for your life, then you have to submit yourself to the Holy Spirit. In other words, allow him to teach you what it is that he needs to teach you. And when you begin to do that, when you allow him to remind you of the things that Jesus taught, which, by the way, first means you have to learn them, so you probably need to read the Bible, right? Can't be reminded of something you haven't learned. And so he's going to remind you of those things, and he's going to teach you exactly what it is that you need to know in order to live in the will of God. In other words, it kind of looks like this. As you're going through life, it's like, okay, take this next step here. No, 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 don't step over there. Step over here. Okay, now take that job. All right, now take that promotion. Okay, now just stay still for a little while. Don't do anything. Okay, now you can go again. All right, now you need to end that relationship. All right, here's a relationship I want you to begin over here. And we kind of go through life. And the reason why I think we get so frustrated about this idea of living in God's will is because we don't always see everything through supernatural eyes like God does. And so what we know is we are here at whatever point in the journey we're in. And so whether you're at A or whether you're at Z or anywhere in between in your journey, what you see is here's where I am now and where I want to be is way down there. Like I want to get to Z and I want to get there as quickly as possible, right? The problem is we can't see all the steps that we need to take in between. And so if we allow ourselves to make those decisions, we take misstep after misstep after misstep. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to come in, he makes sure we take the right steps here and here and here and here. And the hard part for us is that right here in the now, oftentimes we don't see that. Like, I don't see that right now. I just know I want to be there. And, and if I'm going to get there, then I need to jump over to here. And the Holy Spirit's like, slow down, just take this step. But as I look back across my life, right, and I think these are the some, things, some of the things that he brings back into remembrance. As I look back across my life, I begin to see where God was working in my life that brought me to here. And many times when I was in the midst of whatever it was that I was going through, and in those moments where I said, where is God in all of this? Or what am I supposed to do next? How do I take this next step? And I didn't see God in that. Now that I'm, now that I'm kind of down the road from that, and I look back, I see God's hand in it. And I understand the way the Holy Spirit was working here. He guided me here. And so if that didn't happen to me there, I never would end up there. And if I never would have ended up there, then I never would end up here. And if I didn't end up here, then I won't end up down the road over there. And this is something that I hope to talk to you guys a little bit more about next week and expand upon it further in my own life uh, as I venture out into what it is that God has called me to here in the next few weeks. And so uh, we'll talk about more about that. But God wants you to live within his will, and so he sent the Holy Spirit to give you the power to do that, to help you take that next step and that next step and that next step. What it requires, though, is us allowing him to actually guide us. So when you take control of your life, then you live within your own will. 
When you allow him to take control of your life, then you live within his will. And he gives you the power to do that. The second thing is this, is that he gives us the power to share Christ boldly. Right? And this is the scariest one. Anytime you bring out the word evangelism at church, everyone would get scared. Like people start ducking, hiding, diving under pews. Like nobody wants to do that, right? And so if I started a group right now and I was like, hey, we're going to start a new access group and we're going to go door to door evangelism, right? I get like one person there, maybe. And that person would probably be gone after the first week. Like it's just, we hide from this whole idea of sharing our faith because it's scary. And most of us are actually really insecure when it comes to our faith. And so people all the time, they're afraid of doing that. And the reason why is because we get insecure about it. And the reason why we're so insecure is because we, we feel like we don't know enough, right? Like, I don't have the words to say to somebody. Like, what if I'm talking to somebody about Jesus, and then they ask me a question, I don't know the answer to it, right? Like, that's the scariest part, right? And so let me, let me just put you at ease here today. Let me just say this, that if you will commit yourself to sharing Christ, if you'll commit yourself to sharing him with others, and telling the good news, and actually going out and evangelizing, and doing those things, if you'll commit yourself to telling everybody that you can about Jesus, you will get questions you won't know the answer to. <laughs> like, you just will. Like, I'm just, let me let, just take that off your chest right now. You are going to get questions you won't know the answer to. And the reason is because you can't know everything. I get questions all the time that I don't know the answer to. And you know what? It's okay. That's why the Holy Spirit's there. You see, he kind of does two things when it comes to sharing Christ. The first thing he does is he kind of gives you the words to speak. You see, the reality is this, is that even as I sit up here and I preach and I proclaim the gospel, right? Like God's called me to stand up and proclaim the gospel. And so I, I preach. And, uh, and so as I stand up here and I preach, this is what I believe. I believe that as I'm speaking, the Holy Spirit takes over and they're not my words and they're actually his. Like, I actually believe that. Because I know this, I'm not smart enough to do this on my own. I know that I don't have the wisdom and I know that I don't have the knowledge and I don't know that I don't know enough and I can't preach good enough and I can't say the words good enough to get you believe who Jesus is and that he actually wants what's best for you. I can't do it. Because see, you can't see Jesus, you can't hear Jesus, you can't touch Jesus. And so I can't convince you that he's real with my mere words. And so I believe that as I stand up here and begin to proclaim his word, proclaim the good news of Christ, I believe that the Holy Spirit comes in and it's actually his words that come out and not mine. He guides me. And I say stupid stuff sometimes because sometimes it is me speaking, right? But some, most of the time if I say anything that you go, wow, that's profound, that wasn't me. I didn't think of that before I got up here because it's the Holy Spirit just speaking through me. And every single time I preach, when I'm standing back there before I walk out here, I have one prayer and I pray the exact same prayer every single time. And this is what I pray. God, clarity. Give me clarity of thought, give me clarity of speech, and give them clarity of understanding. Because I know that this is what's going to happen. As I begin to stand up here and boldly proclaim the gospel and proclaim Jesus Christ in God's word, that the Holy Spirit is not only going to speak through me, but he's going to speak to you at the same time. I don't have the words all on my own. And this is how I know when God has spoken through me. And this is how I know when it's worked out. It's not because I go out in the lobby afterwards and I get a bunch of high fives and that was awesome. Like, I like those, right? We all like accolades. We all like people that, you know, speak our wonders. And so I like that. It's nice, you know, when somebody tells me how well I did. But this is when I know. When somebody comes up to me and they say, man, you were speaking to me today. I felt like I was the only person in the room today. And this is what I know when somebody says that to me. <laughs> that I wasn't speaking to you today. He was. And then as I'm speaking, he begins to speak through me, but he's also whispering in your ears. And so as I say something, he brings revelation and clarity to what I'm saying to you in your moment right there where you are in your circumstance. I don't know what all of you are going through, but he does. And so as I'm speaking up here, he's able to speak to you right there. And so the first thing that happens when we allow the Holy Spirit to give us the power to pr proclaim him boldly is he actually gives us the words. Paul actually says the same thing. Like Paul stands up and kind of says what I said just a minute ago, that he doesn't really have the words. This is what he said in Corinthians. He said, my message and my preaching were not with wise, or were not uh, with wise and persuasive words. In other words, I, I couldn't speak wise enough and bold enough and with enough knowledge to convince people. This is Paul, like the first missionary, probably the greatest missionary that's ever walked on this planet. It. Like, we're talking about the Apostle Paul here. He stands up and says that my words weren't wise and they weren't persuasive. But what he did have is this. But with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom but on God's power alone. You see, if you can stand up and speak for God and your words are good enough to get people to believe, that belief will only rest on your words alone. And when things go bad, those will crumble and fall. Why? Because they weren't from the Spirit. They were just from you. And so I know that I can stand up here and I might be able to inspire you with my words for but a moment, but I can't inspire you to truly change your life and live a life that's pleasing to God. It takes the Holy Spirit to do that. So that's the first thing that happens when it comes to proclaiming him boldly. The second thing is this, that he actually gives us courage. That he, his power comes upon us and we actually have the courage to proclaim Christ boldly. 
Um, just a couple weeks ago when I spoke, I kind of made reference to this time that Paul, or not Paul, excuse me, Peter and John were before what's called the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin were the, the religious leaders of the time there in Jerusalem. And so it was made up of priests and Pharisees and another group called Sadducees. And these were all the religious leaders. These were the smartest, the brightest, the most powerful men in Jerusalem. And there were 70 of them. And they had formed this council that kind of ruled Israel at the time. Uh, of course, the Romans were there ruling, but they ruled the spiritual aspect of Israel at the time, of all, all the Jews. And so after Jesus ascends back to heaven, the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples and they begin to proclaim Christ. And all of a sudden, thousands of people are coming to Christ and following him. The, the Sanhedrin gets word of it and they don't like it. They didn't like it when Jesus did it. They don't like it when the disciples are now doing it. And so they hauled Peter and John before them and they pulled them in and arrested them. And the next day, they stood before that court. And the Bible says that the Spirit came upon Peter. He stood up and he proclaimed the gospel. And this is what the Bible says. It says that the, the Sanhedrin looked at them and said, man, we can tell that they're unlearned men. And idiotes is the word that's used there, which means idiots. And so they're saying, these guys, they're, they're not very bright. Like, these guys aren't smart at all. But they've been with Jesus, right? And so they were marked as have been being with Jesus. And this is what the Sanhedrin said. We can't deny the power of God on your life right now. We don't like what you're saying and we don't like what you're teaching, but we can't deny that something's different about you because you're not smart enough to stand up here and talk like that. We know because we, we knew you before, right? And so we saw you following Jesus. You weren't that smart. And so we know something's happening here. And so we're going to let you go, but this is what we say to you. Stop preaching and stop proclaiming Christ in his resurrection. And so Peter says, who are we to follow? Are we to follow God or are we to follow man? And he dedicates himself to go out, and no matter what the religious leaders are said of the day, they were going to continue to preach. And so they went back to the rest of the disciples and the rest of the followers that were there in Jerusalem, and they said that they've ordered us not to preach anymore, but we're going to continue to preach. Now this, this had heavy implications, because see, their life was in the hands of those rulers. They, could, they took Jesus' life, they could just as easily take theirs. Now how many of you would be scared in that moment, right? Like if I walked up here today and I said, here's the deal. The United States government said, we can't proclaim Jesus anymore, but we're going to anyways. And when we do, they're probably going to arrest us and kill us, right? How many of you are like, I'm down? Like, that's a kind of a scary thing, right? And so they're all afraid, and they're there, but they still want to commit themselves to preaching the gospel. And so the Bible says that they prayed. And, and this is what it says after they prayed in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. In other words, courage came upon them, and they preached without abandon. And they didn't care who heard them preach and who didn't hear them preach, because there was boldness there. There was a courage there. You know, I have two great fears in my life. Uh, my first great fear is spiders. I hate spiders. I can't stand spiders. If you ever want to hear me and see me scream like a little girl and run, you just bring a spider near me, and I guarantee that's what you'll see. And so in my house, whenever there's a spider, I don't kill it. My, my wife has to kill it, or my children. <laughs> like, I send my kids into the slaughter. You know what I'm saying? Like, son, I need you to step on that spider right there. I know you're only five, and I'm 37, but I need you to kill that spider because I'm not going near it. Because I know this is what's going to happen. He's going to dodge my foot and jump on my leg and bite me. That's what's going to happen. Anybody else there? They're quick, and they're tricky, and, and they hate people. And so... So I'm deathly afraid of spiders, and my wife will mess with me, and this is what she does. She'll kill it, and she'll do one of two things every single time. She'll either leave it there, and I'm like, you get rid of it, and you get rid of it right now. And she's like, no, I'm going to leave it right there. And the reason why she needs to get rid of it is because it's playing dead. It's not really dead. It's playing dead. And when I go to bed that night, it's going to find me, and it's going to get revenge for me sticking my wife on it. I know that's going to happen. The other thing she will do is she will pick it up, like, you know, with a tissue, and instead of throwing it away, she'll chase me around the house with it. And once again, I scream and run like a little seven-year-old girl. Ah! You know, and she just chases me around the house. So I'm, I'm deathly afraid of spiders. And I'm not proud of that, but that's the truth. The other great fear in my life is public speaking. I am scared to death to stand up to people and speak publicly. Yet somehow, this twisted God that we have has called me to do this, right? Like he's got a sense of humor. He just does. And I remember the first time that I was ever asked to preach to adults. And uh, I was actually working for my father at that time. He's here in the audience, and he, he should remember this as well. And so, I'm, I don't know, I was 23, 24 years old, and uh, a freshman in Bible college. And I was the youth pastor at the time in the little church that we were at. My father was the senior pastor. And, and one week he says to me, hey, Jay, you're going to preach on Sunday night. And I was like, say what? Excuse me? What? No. Mm -mm, don't feel God in that, right? But I'd have a choice because he was my boss. And he says, no, you're going to preach on Sunday night. And luckily he gave me like five weeks to prepare. Like he gave me a big, long window to prepare. And I don't know if that was like him being generous or if that was him like you know, kind of chuckling at me in the background because I died a thousand deaths every day for five weeks. 
right? Like if he just would give me three days, it probably would have gone better. But he gave me five weeks or so to prepare. And I remember every single day just being so scared and telling myself, I can't do this. And God sent me an awesome wife who was like, you can do this. And I remember that Sunday showing up. And Sunday morning came and I was super nervous, even Sunday morning. And I felt sick, you know, I felt sickness coming on. I probably got to call in tonight. And I'm like trying to think of any way that I can to get out of preaching. And then you know, the afternoon goes by, and Sunday night shows up, and uh, there at that church, we used to, first of all, we had a pulpit, not, not like a table, so you stood behind the pulpit to preach, but during worship, the staff, the rest of the pastors, we actually were on the, the platform through worship as well, and so we had, we had some chairs off to, facing the audience off to the right, and they weren't like the big thrones, luckily, but there were some chairs over there, and so that's where we sat during worship, and so uh, there I am, and on Sunday mornings, we had to wear suits, and on Sunday evenings, we were able to go casual and take our ties off, so I'm rocking an awesome suit with no tie, sitting over there on the side. And, and as worship's going on, I'm literally, every, every song that goes by, I'm dying a thousand deaths. I'm sweating. I'm nervous. My face is probably beat red. I feel sick like I'm going to throw up. I didn't know how I was going to do this. And I have never prayed so much for revival in my life. Because I went to a Pentecostal church, and you know what I was hoping? That God would move, and we would just sing for two hours, and I would never have to preach. Like, oh my God, if you're going to move, now is the time, Right? come Holy Spirit. That's, that's, that's where I was, that whole service. And that was actually kind of normal sometimes in that church, and it just didn't happen that night because God has a sick sense of humor. And so we sing our songs, and then it's time for me to stand up and preach. And I walk up, and I was so scared. I remember as I approached the pulpit, which is right here, uh, there was a door exiting the sanctuary right over here. And I'm literally thinking to myself, if I just walk past the pulpit, down the steps, and out the door, everything will be okay. This thought actually went through my mind. But I stopped at the pulpit, and I started to speak, and it was really tough at first. And normally during the speaking, the staff would at least go down and sit. But my dad stayed right up over here. And I think he was just there for support, you know? He just wanted me to know that he was there with me. And I remember after, you know, I don't know, a couple of minutes, which my whole sermon probably didn't last 15 minutes. I bet it didn't even last that. Because I was probably talking this fast. And, just go, blah, blah, blah. and I remember looking over, and my dad was sitting there, and he just kind of gave me this little thumbs up and a nod, like, you can do this. And it was like, it was like everything just settled in that moment. And in that moment, I was able to finish. It wasn't a good sermon at all. I don't, listen, I've blocked it out of my memory. It definitely wasn't a good sermon. <laughs> but ever since that day, it was like the Holy Spirit said, okay, it's okay, you've got this. And even today, I'm scared to death before walking, walking out here every single morning. And I stand back there and I pace up and down the hall. <laughs> and on the mornings that I'm preaching and we're out there doing setup, at least five people are always like, you okay? And I'm like, yep, I'm fine. It's because in my head I'm saying, what are you doing? You can't do this. You, you just can't do this. This is terrible. You're going to go up there, you're going to say something stupid, you're going to trip and fall, your fly's going to be down. Something. I check my fly a dozen times every Sunday before walking out here. I just know it's going to happen one day. And every, all of you are going to know it, and I'm not, and no one's going to have the decency to tell me. And so I'm afraid of that. But I'm scared to death of that. But when I allow the Holy Spirit's power to come in and I do what it is that he asked me to do, which is proclaim him boldly, then I know when I step up here, he steps in, he takes over, and his words come through, and it feels like all the fear subsides, and I'm able to do what he called me to do, not from my own natural ability and talents, not from my own wisdom and eloquent words, but they're all his. And he can do that for you too. And so as you begin to proclaim Christ to others, as you begin to go out and be a witness to others, I guarantee you this, that if you'll simply ask and pray like they did back then for courage, then he will come in, he will give you the courage, and you'll be able to boldly proclaim him. You're going to get questions you're not going to know the answer to, but it's okay. Because really it's all on him and not on you at all. And so that's the second thing he wants to give you power for. The third thing is this, he wants to give you power to live a holy life. The Bible's full of this little phrase, you know, I am holy, therefore be holy, Right? You need to be holy because your God is holy. There's something about living in obedience to God and living according to his will. And like we said earlier, that when you're born, there's a sinful nature inside of you. There's a sinful spirit that's inside of you, and it doesn't just go away. Paul says that we're at war with it, and every single day we have to get up and make a decision. Am I going to live today according to my flesh or my sinful nature? Am I going to live today according to his spirit, which has been placed inside of me because I now believe in Jesus Christ? Which one am I going to live according to? Because if you're an unbeliever, especially, that you have to deal with this. And even as a believer, you have to deal with this. This is what, this is what the Bible says. Romans 8, 5, and 6. 
He says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, right? So those of you who aren't believers, you're dominated by a sinful nature, and so you think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. In other words, when, when you don't know him, when you're a non-believer, you're dominated by the sinful nature, and even as a believer, you still have to make the decision to live according to the Holy Spirit. And so every single day, there's this voice in your head that kind of says, it's okay, you can be jealous, that's all right, you should be jealous, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, you should hold a grudge, too. Don't forget give, you got to hold them accountable for what they did to you, right? And so you hear these voices, yeah, yeah, do that. You can look at that. Your wife will never find out that you looked at that because you're smart and you know how to work the computer. And so go ahead, look at it one more time. And these voices are always there trying to tell you what to do, right? And so like, yeah, scream at your kids, yell at your wife, look at that on the computer, honk your horn only after the light's been green for a second and a half. You can do all these things, right? And so there's this sinful nature that drives you to constantly sin, not to live a holy life, but it's always pushing you and pushing you and pushing you to further extremes away from God's will for your life and towards the life that your own sinful nature wants to live. But the Bible says that those of you who live by the Spirit, it's the opposite that happens. That when you choose every single day to get up and live according to the Spirit, although yes, there are those moments where you want to scream and you want to shout and you want to be angry and you want to not forgive and you want to hold a grudge and you want to be bitter, right? And you want to say those words and you want to be that nasty and you want to laugh at that dirty joke or tell that dirty joke and you want to go on the computer and look at things that you shouldn't be looking at and you want to lust after that woman that just walked by. We, there, you want to do those things, but when you're living according to the Spirit, he comes in and he actually gives you the power to resist the temptation. And he says, you don't have to lust. You don't have to scream at your kids. No, don't make that decision. No, don't step there. No, don't do that. Don't honk the horn. Wait at least three seconds before you honk the horn. Like he comes in and he gives you the ability and the power to do those things when you live by the Spirit. The rest of the scripture verse says this. If your sinful nature controls your mind, right? There is only death. Like that's where it leads to, death. Spiritual death, but in the end, a real death that lasts eternity. And so when you obey and listen to the sinful nature that is in you, then it only leads to death. But if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, there is life, and then there's also one other thing added, and there is peace. In other words, you can live in peace here and now simply by submitting to the power of the Holy Spirit. And he can give you the power to resist temptation. I mean, we live in a tough world out there right now. There is not a day that goes by that you will not be attacked from all sides by all kinds of temptation, especially sexually. Like, we bring that up a lot because our, wor our world and our culture is just, it's just invaded by it. And every single day, you'll be faced with making decisions that will either fulfill your sinful nature or they'll fulfill his. And so what you have to do is submit yourself to the Holy Spirit, allow his power to come in and give you the power to resist and fight off that temptation. You see, the beauty of what Jesus did for us when he came is that he also suffered the exact same temptations that you and I suffer through, yet he, filled with the Holy Spirit, was able to resist all of them. And he offers you the exact same spirit. And he offers you the exact same thing. No, is it to live a perfect life? No, because we're all sinful and you'll make mistakes along the way just like I'll make mistakes and you'll have setbacks and you'll do stupid stuff and you'll say stupid things and you'll treat your spouse in a way you shouldn't and you'll yell at your kids even though you shouldn't and you'll do all of those things. But because of the power of the Holy Spirit, you can pick yourself back up and you can start a new day fresh every single day and you can go out and resist those temptations every single time and that's what the power of the Holy Spirit is for. And finally this, the fourth thing that the Spirit gives you the power to make a difference with spiritual gifts. And this is one of those areas that we tend to like, ah, throw your hands up when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about this more later on in this series. And so I'm just going to kind of give you a little overview here. But, uh, but he wants to actually gift you. And the, the spiritual gifts are this. They're these supernatural abilities to do things, to build up the body of Christ. In other words, they're not natural to you. They're not your natural abilities. They're not just things that you're good at, like regularly. We all have natural abilities and natural giftings, but we're talking about supernatural giftings. And so some of you here today, you're gifted with mercy. Like you look at people that are hurting and you have this supernatural ability just to empathize with them, right? I, I don't have that gift. I really don't. Last night, my wife and I were at Starbucks and uh, we're getting, we go in there and we order our drinks and I look over and I don't know who they were and I don't think they're here today, so I'm talking about them. And, and there's this, this couple sitting over on, at Star on the side there in the restaurant or in the store and the guy is sitting there and he's He's bent over with his head in his girl, I guess it's his girlfriend's lap, and he's just weeping. And I'm just like, first of all, I'm like, come on, man. This is public. Like, come on. Like, straighten up. You're a man. Stop crying, okay? And see, I didn't, there was no empathy there whatsoever. I didn't know what he's going through. My wife's like, oh, you don't know what they're going through. Maybe they're breaking up, or maybe someone just died. You don't know. And I'm like, I don't care. That man is bawling his eyes out. He needs to stop right now and be a man. 
Right? I, don't, I, just, I don't have the gift of mercy, right? Some of you here today, you see somebody that's hurting and you go and you sit down and you weep with them and then all of a sudden everything's okay. And I want to say straighten up, right? That's what I want to do. Let's find a solution and get over it, right? That's me. I don't have that. I can th- although I will say this. There are times when I, I do feel for people because I do remember one time in the last 13 years where I cried with somebody. And so I, I, can, I have a heart, all right? One time in the last 13 years, right? I don't have that gift. Some of you have that gift. Some of you have the gift of administration, just supernaturally, somehow, you see the order of things. And you can walk into any situation, no matter how chaotic it is, and you can bring order to it, and you can organize it. It's the supernatural ability that God has given you to, to bring order. And so some of you have that gift. Some of you have the gift of tongues, and you speak in other tongues. Some of you have the gift of prophecy. Some of you have the gift to interpret those other tongues. Some of you have uh, you know, other gifts, like the gift of knowledge or the gift of wisdom. Some of you have the gift of discernment. You find it easy to look at somebody and kind of size them up immediately. Not judging them, but on a spiritual level. You can discern things about them and discern things in the spiritual that the rest of us don't see. And so you have that ability, some of you do. Some of you, it's the gift of teaching or the gift of preaching. Like there's all these different gifts, right? Some of you have the gifts of baking your pastor's cookies. And that is a valid and very important gift. And I say do that and use it for all of its good, okay? Some of you have that gift. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. People just like being around you. They're drawn to you because you have the ability to speak to them and just pick them up. Sometimes you, just your presence there with them makes them feel better about themselves and so people tend to flock to you. There's all these different gifts and God has given them to his church so that it can build up the body, okay? This is, what, this is what Hebrews says. God testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit to, uh, distributed according to his will. In other words, he distributes the gifts according to his will. And so the gifts that you receive are the gifts that he decides you receive so that when we all work in them together, it builds up the body of Christ. First Corinthians says this, a spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping the entire church. I can't always explain spiritual gifts. Like, I, I don't get it. Like, somehow I'm better at something than I should be. And so, like, for me, coming up here and teaching, that, that's a spiritual gift. I know because I've already told you. I'm scared to death to do it. And I don't have the words to stand up here and do this, but it's something that God has gifted me to. There's something supernatural to my ability to sit up here and talk. And I'm not saying, hey, listen to me. Look at how great I am. What I'm actually saying is I wouldn't do this by choice. But somehow God has gifted me, and he's given you gifts as well. Some are more public than others, but they're all just as valuable. And so whatever gift he gives you, you need to use and live in that gift, flow in that gift. That's why Growth Track Class 3 is so important. If you have not been through Growth Track here at Access, you need to get into Growth Track, and you need to go through Growth Track Class 3, because in it we do something called the Spiritual Gifts Assessment, where we simply ask you 72 simple questions. And when you answer those 72 questions, it hopefully points us in a direction to see where it is that God has gifted you so that you can do ministry, so that you can make a difference in others' lives. It's not for you in your own glory, and it's not for you to have a title. It's not for any of those things. It is simply so that you can make a difference in the lives of the people around you, collectively, together, as a body. So the Holy Spirit is a very real person, and he's absolutely essential to you living the kind of life that God called you to. Because without the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll only ever be probably half the Christian that you could be. And so here's my very simple like, advice to you today. Two things. The very first thing is this, as we close. The very first thing is this. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. The Bible actually speaks of us resisting the Holy Spirit, of actually accepting him. You need to accept the Holy Spirit. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. In other words, when he wants to work and move in your life, when he wants to guide you, when he wants to help you proclaim things boldly, when he wants to help you live a holy life, when he wants to gift you for the benefit of others, don't resist the Holy Spirit and his work in your life. And for the most part, when we resist the Holy Spirit, it's for one of two reasons. (laughs) Number one, because it goes against our sinful nature and selfishly we want to live a different way. And the other reason is because we just don't seem to understand. And can I tell you this today? It's okay that you don't understand. It's okay. Just allow it to happen. Allow him to move in your life. And so don't resist him. The other thing is this. It's actually the opposite of that. It's actually to seek the Holy Spirit. I encourage every single one of you on a daily basis to actually seek the Holy Spirit. Just as those disciples did when they were commanded not to preach anymore. They went back and they asked for the power of the Holy Spirit so they could proclaim him. They simply asked and they simply seeked him. Whether you understand it or not, you can simply say, God, today I ask that the power of the Holy Spirit would fill my life. Help me to live the kind of life you want me to live. Help me to proclaim him boldly and gift me so that I can help those around me. I guarantee you this, if you'll seek him, he'll show up. If you ask for the Holy Spirit, he'll give you the Holy Spirit and you won't just be with him. He won't just be with you. He'll be within you and he will fill your life. 
he will fill you with power to do supernatural things. And you may not understand that and I may not understand that, but it doesn't make it any less real. So don't resist him and actually seek him. And you can start by doing that today. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. That you sent your son to come here to live a perfect life and to die, but you didn't just leave him here one single solitary person. But God, when he returned to you, you sent the Holy Spirit here so that he could live with each and every one of us, not just with us, but in us. And that he gives us power to live out the kind of life that you want us to live. Because without him, we just couldn't do it. Because in the natural, there's nothing we can do to live the kind of life that you've called us to. And so God, help us to submit to the power of the Holy Spirit. To invite him in, to make him an everyday part of our lives. And so we just pray that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit right here, right now, today. So we can be the kind of people you called us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed. Maybe you're here today and you just don't get all of this. Like you're here and you're checking things out. You're kind of maybe giving God a try. Someone invited you. Maybe you came with family members. But you you don't understand what I'm talking about because as we said before, that those who are not Christ followers just simply can't understand. But there's something tugging at your heart today that as you're here and you're hearing my words, it's not my words that are affecting you, but the Holy Spirit himself is drawing you. And you may not understand it, but that's what that is. That's that voice in the back of your head right now. That's that feeling you have down in your gut right now that says, is this real? Maybe this is real. Maybe I should give this a try. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you to Christ. And the Bible says this, that, that we can have a relationship with our Creator because of the work of Jesus Christ. And so if you're here today and you've been living your life for yourself and you're ready to try something new and you're ready to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ and to begin to live for something so much greater than yourself, if you're tired of trying it your own way and you're ready to try something different, you can make that decision today. And the Bible says this, that if we will simply profess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that he was raised from the dead, then we will be saved. That you can begin a relationship with Jesus Christ here and now today by simply believing and asking him to be a part of your life by surrendering your life. And the Bible says that when he does, the Holy Spirit, who we've been talking about today, will come and be a part of your life and help you live the life that you were created to live. And so if you're here today and you're ready to make that decision and you want to pray that prayer with me here today while no one is looking around, would you just slip your hand up so that I know who I'm praying for today? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And I want you in your own words and in your own heart to follow me and pray that prayer as well. And I believe that when you do that, your eternity will be changed. Your life will be changed forever because the Spirit will fill you and you'll begin a relationship with Jesus Christ today and begin to live for Him and no longer for yourself. And so let's pray. Father, I thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth to live a perfect life and die in my place. So today I profess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I also ask that you would forgive me of my sins and that you would help me from this point forward through your spirit to begin to live a holy life, a life that's pleasing to you, to no longer live for myself, but to begin to live for you and for others. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we just had at least three people raise their hand and make that decision today. Can we celebrate that here today? We celebrate with you today. Here at Access, we exist to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is what I believe, that as a result of the decision that you just made today and that prayer that you prayed today, you began a relationship that's going to alter your life forever. A relationship with your Creator through Jesus Christ. And this is what I believe, that from this point going forward, He's begun to guide your steps.